Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Oman. This is a really great map of Oman. I really uh, just like staring at it and seeing all the little details on it. It's like the perfect map. I love it. So Oman is on the Arabian Peninsula in the Middle East, Western Asia, has some interesting borders. We have this border here with Yemen. We have this border with Saudi Arabia. Do you know what I always say about straight line borders, right? They're not made by Mother Nature. And we have a border with the United Arab Emirates or the UAE. And this is where it gets interesting. Oman has two exclaves, the biggest one being right up here. This is Musandam. And it's at a very strategic place here on the Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf. A lot of shipping goes through this area out into the Gulf of Oman. You can see right here. So this is part of Oman. And then there's another one right here called Manda. And it's also just a little bitty exclave of Oman. So the United Arab Emirates which we'll cover in a few months is sort of like the Arab version of the United States in that it's various emirates clumped together to form one country like the United States is a bunch of states clumped together to form one country so as the emirates were becoming one country these spots decided they wanted to remain part of Oman so they did and here they are so Oman, as you can see, is part of the southern part of the peninsula, bordering the Arabian Sea here on the Indian Ocean. It has quite a few islands, the biggest being Masira, you can see right here. There's also a bunch of little islands down here. They're known as the Kuria Musia Islands, or the Halania, Halania Islands. But they're, you know, not really lived in. There's some villages here on Masira. They're mostly natural places and places for diving and exploring, things like that, but not so much for living on. All the living in Oman tends to happen up in this corner up here. So, you can imagine that this country is pretty deserty, very hot. So, along the coast here, there is a big chain of mountains. It's known as the Al Hajar Mountains. The highest point in the country is right here. It is Jabal Shams. And thanks to these mountains, it can kind of keep the area a little cooler. Just like trap the, the oceany air here. Now you can see in this area lots and lots of water and you think, wow, there's a lot of rivers in Oman down here as well, but Oman actually has no rivers. These are not rivers. They are called wadis, which is a temporary flow of water. It can be in like a stream or even a lake, but they exist in desert areas. Once monsoon rains come, they flow, flow, flow. Once the sun comes and the rains stop, they're gone. So there's an interesting spot well, throughout the area, but this area over here is the UNESCO World Heritage Site that commemorates the special irrigation systems that were built during the ancient times to try to keep this water so that they could farm in these areas. There's not a lot of farming in Oman, it's mainly date palms, but you know, those are perfect for desert farming, right? They still need lots of water though, so they use these wadis to irrigate, they've got reservoirs and things, they make the most of them. So they are not permanent whatsoever, but you know, modern technologies and even ancient technologies can help to keep the water intact. Pretty interesting. The capital city of Muscat is right over here. And nearly 
I think it's like 90% of the population of Oman live in this area, with 50% of that 90% in Muscat. Very beautiful coastal towns. Um, you can see on the cover of the book here, there's a friendly face right there, but all of the buildings are white or beige to kind of give off this um, kind of relaxing architecture. I matched my nails to it. I've got white and beige and some sparkles because I have to have sparkles. It's the law, <laughs> my personal law. So that's an interesting feature of this area. As we move south, we get a lot of nothing. A lot, a lot of nothing. Let me explain. This big wadi right here is the Uma Samim. And it is an interesting one in that it collects all the water that flows down when there is water. And then that dries up and then it just sits there and gets all mushy, yucky, and muddy, and um, essentially turns into quicksand, a huge field of quicksand, and until it eventually dries up during the hot season, right? Then over here, you can see this dotted area over here. Most of it is in Saudi Arabia. This is the Rub al Khali, or the empty quarter. There is nothing here. There is sand. There's sand. That's it the empty quarter. It's slowly becoming not so empty and that roads are being built across and uh, the various little oases throughout in Saudi Arabia at least are being developed. Uh, but historically it has been nothing. Like this is like recent history, like as the late 2010s this has been happening. So that's the first time in history that there has been something in the nothing. This area, as we would say in the Western world, is supposedly haunted. But in the Middle Eastern world, this area has a population of jinn, which are mischievous spirits. Um, jinn, for the most part, are very bad, or at best, they're mischievous. So you don't want to go wandering out here, or the jinn, are, they're going to come get you. Interesting. Let's move down south to here, to the Dofar region. This whole chunk right here is the Dofar region. And it becomes, as you can see, a lot more lush and relaxed. The Dofar mountains are right here along the coast. So there are towns along here between the coast and the mountains. Not a lot of space, as you can see. So a lot more cooler winds get trapped in here. And the major city down here is Salala, which is a great name, Salala. And uh, it's something like 30 degrees cooler during the summer than it is in Muscat. It's been the ancestral home of the sultans for quite a long time. Until 1970, which we'll talk about. And you can see lots and lots of wadis over here. And the main farming thing since ancient times was frankincense. It's a little more diversified, but you can see right here the land of frankincense is the name of the historical site here where the frankincense trees grew. And I think I'll seg that into the history because we don't really know a lot about ancient Omani history. For the longest time, until Islam was introduced, there was no writing system in place for the people that lived here. So some ancient evidence, we found some artifacts that date to like Paleolithic times, very old times. There's some mention in Mesopotamia of a land here called Magan, and they were mostly known for the frankincense trade. Egypt loved frankincense. The Greeks loved frankincense. Eventually the Romans would love frankincense. So frankincense was traded all throughout this corner of the world. This is where the best frankincense grew. Everyone wanted it. The people here were happy to oblige. For a moment, it was the richest little corner of the world during those very ancient times, getting rich, rich, rich off of frankincense. And it's believed that at some point in history, probably during the time of Cyrus the Great, 
that this area came under the jurisdiction of Persia or even under Persian rule, but there's no real evidence of that. So, <sighs> sorry about that. I'm pretty sure someone in my building has COVID. Anyway, I'll edit out the worst of it. <laughs> Hopefully he's gonna be quiet. Anyway, so like I said, we don't really know much about what was going on in this area in detail other than they got really rich and many different cultures lived in this area. Um, we'll talk more about that when we get to the UAE because all of the E's in the UAE were their own different culture. They kind of mushed together in what's now Oman and Yemen. The Azd were one of the like main ancient groups I found at this time. And they came between the years 120 and 200 CE. And it's kind of this period between like the ancient frankincense trade and the introduction of Islam that this corner of the world became a huge maritime trading empire. They built their own special sea craft called Daos, which were incredibly fast and very efficient in trade. So now they could trade with Asia, they could trade with the African coast, they traded all over the place and they became even more affluent and wealthy and well connected. We'll see pictures of Taos in the book. We'll flip through after I finish history. And it's also during this time that we get that really cool irrigation system. So since they were so well connected, Islam came almost as soon as it was founded in this area in the seventh century, really took off in the area. Um, the Umayyads would have been the first to have oversight of this area, but not direct control. And after that caliphate lost power, the first imamate of Oman was formed sometime between 750 and 755. So like the start of Islam, like I think the people here converted when Muhammad was still alive. Like that's how soon they had converted. I'm pretty sure about that. Anyway. Maritime trade exploded even more at this time. I've said a lot in the Africa videos I've done how, like, the cultures there had trade with the Middle East. That's what I'm talking about. They had lots of trade here. And, um, same with, like, Southeast Asia. When I say they even had trade with Middle Eastern peoples, that's what I'm talking about. They were all over the Indian Ocean, like, at every corner doing all the big trades. So, and oh, they've traded up north as well with, um, it would have been like the Abbasid Caliphate at that time over in what's now like Syria, Israel, Jordan, all of that over there. But that sort of began its downfall in 1507 when the Portuguese arrived. I was reading in here about how they found um, one of Vasco da Gama's ships off the coast of Oman that had allegedly sunk during his journey around Africa and up here to figure out the routes that these people were trading on. So they built up Muscat and used it as an outpost to protect the various shipping lanes that they were establishing throughout the Indian Ocean. And, um, you know, the people here weren't too pleased about that, especially when the Portuguese got really overbearing, but they'll fix that in a second. The Ottoman Empire, of course, challenged them quite a bit. And also, once it became a thing, the Dutch East India Companies and the um, British East India Company uh, would have very much fought against them for control of the area, which they would eventually get. And in 1650, the imam in the region was finally like, okay, Portuguese, get out. And the Portuguese were driven out. And it was time for maritime trade to rise back up. And they went all along the African coast down here and uh, found all the Portuguese ports that had been established and took them over. The most notable of this was the island of Zanzibar off of Mozambique. They also took um, Mombasa, and what's now Kenya, Kilwa, and what's now Tanzania, all the big coastal cities 
It's known as the Swahili Coast. Um, oh, what was I watching? It might have been Geography Now, about how um, the Swahili language is a mixture of, like, the Arabic spoken in Oman and the African languages mushed together so they could easily communicate while they traded. Hmm, I don't remember where I heard that, so I might be wrong. Uh, or I might be confusing with another country, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Interesting, right? Um, Zanzibar became very affluent at this time. It was pretty much like Oman too. It would eventually become its own sultanate. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So, like I said, the British East India Company held sway over this sea trading lanes, right? The British in general. So, um, the Sultanate here and Britain were like this. Like, um, you know, the, the British instinct at this time was to completely conquer, but I think they knew that it was better just to have like a very tight friendship with Oman and be like, look, we'll watch out for each other's backs and, you know, we'll just protect each other, basically. I think with the intent on trying to slowly take over, which is what they did, they would eventually sign various treaties, um, mainly to prevent competition in the area from like the Dutch and what have you in terms of trade but they would slowly, slowly clench their grip into Oman, basically, and sink their teeth in and control more and more. Um, the, the split with Zanzibar happened in 1856. The current sultan died with two sons, and um, I guess the British didn't like one of the sons, so instead of having a a power struggle to figure out who would be the next sultan. They were like, we'll have one sultan here, the sultan of Muscat it would have been, and the sultan of Zanzibar, and it became its own thing. Just to get him out of the way, you know. So, eventually the people more inland were like, um, we noticed that the British are slowly sinking their teeth into the area. We do not like that. We just want to be doing our own thing. So, there was some conflict there. Eventually, the Treaty of Sieb in 1920 would have created the Sultanate of Oman and the Sultanate of Muscat. Of course, the Sultanate, Sultanate of Muscat would have been on the coast, and Oman would have been in the interior, right? It's still pretty tense, especially when oil drilling became a big thing. You can see some of the oil rigs. Let's see. I'm perched a little odd from the map, but you can see some oil up here in various parts of the country. There's oil drilling. So, of course, the British wanted a hand in that. Became a whole thing. Became very tense. Anyway, the next sultan to be in charge of Muscat would have been Saeed bin Taimur in 1932 who was quite a character, first of all. Um, there are various wars with the Sultanate of Oman over here, and they were known as the Jebel Wars, or the Mountain Wars. Eventually, since um, Sa Sultan Said had the British's help, they conquered and reunited the country into pretty much what it is today. Then, in... Um, 1959, oil was discovered down here in Dofar. And I saw, yeah, you can see little oil wells over here as well. So they were like, bingo, money, right? A um, couple of things, though. First of all, Sultan Said was, like I said, a character. Sort of like, I don't want to say the Kims over in North Korea, but kind of like the Kims over North Korea, not in the aspect of um, massive concentration camps and all of that, but Oman became more and more isolated from the rest of the world. There was a big focus on keeping tradition exactly as it should be and keeping any outside influence outside of Oman, which led to um, high... Um, 
oh, what's it called? I just blinked on it. The life expectancy, or a low life expectancy, high infant mortality, that was the word I was looking for. A higher infant mortality, much lower life expectancy, diseases rampant because they don't have modern hospitals. There's really like no schools in the area, like schools as we know it today, right? And um, the country was in a massive decline. Not to mention, Sultan Saeed was extremely paranoid. Um, he lived as like a recluse and um, locked up his sons, most notably his oldest son, Kabus, remember that? Um, he, he kept them on house arrest because because he was just a paranoid kind of guy. He outlawed so he outlawed sunglasses. He outlawed um, smoking. He outlawed football, which is <laughs> wild. Football's like the biggest sport in the world, right? Um, but most unusually, he outlawed conversations lasting longer than 15 minutes. That's how paranoid he was. He was so sure that a grand conspiracy was going to happen, which it would eventually, but hold on to that. Dofar, right, has oil. Oop, cat here. Dofar has oil. And the wealth from all of this oil is obviously not going back to the people because they don't have schools, they don't have health care, they don't have anything, really. So, it gets so bad that in the Dofar region, a rebel group springs up, and it is pro-Soviet communist. And, man, to have communist rebels in an Arab country, like... I don't know, like, the, the values of, like, Islam in Arab countries are, like, the opposite end of values of communism. So, like, you've messed up if your Arab population is deciding that communism might be better. You've goofed at that point. So, a civil war sparks between the Dofar rebels and the soldiers of the Sultan, which just leads to more paranoia from the Sultan, of course. So, things are going from bad to worse. So in 1970, uh, the Sultan's oldest son, Qaboos bin Said, overthrows his father in what is technically a bloodless coup, but Sultan Said accidentally shot himself in the foot, so there was some blood. He got transported over to London to have surgery on his foot, and he stayed in London till he passed away. So Sultan Qaboos became the Sultan in 1970. And he said, look, all this money we have stockpiled up, not going to the people, it's all going back to the people. And he did all the reforms. He implemented state-of-the-art health care, which was, of course, free. State-of-the-art education, which was free for everyone. Men, women, children, whoever, right? Literacy rate skyrocketed. Um, life expectancy skyrocketed. skyrocketed. Infant mortality sank, right? There we go infrastructure. Oman didn't even have roads at this point, so he built roads, um, ports, airports, all of that. Um, he restructured the government. So, um, Oman to this day is still an absolute monarchy. Like, absolute monarchy. Sultan does literally everything. He's the president and prime minister and the Supreme Court and everything. He's everything. But he established an, what's basically an advisory council, half of which is chosen by the Sultan and the other half is voted on by the people. So he established voting rights for, you know, everyone over 21, men and women, everything in between. So um, there's even been women elected to that advisory council since uh, I think the first women were elected in 2011 which very famously in the Arab world was the Arab Spring protest movement which there were some in Oman and it was mostly for more um, transparency in the government which the Sultan said he would do and kind of didn't the one downside to this like sweeping overhaul of the country was that it was illegal to criticize the government and especially the sultan you would get thrown in jail so um you know nothing like that journalists better be careful to not say anything negative about the government you know that's definitely the downside 
Sultan Qaboos also really focused on cultural preservation. He really went above and beyond in terms of not just things like museums, but like tours of different Omani cultures throughout the country so that people could experience it in their little villages. He would set up like a once a year tour of the country where he would literally just like go to town centers in like people's homes and be like what do you need fixed and then he would fix it within reason you know so like boom it became a first world country i want to say overnight but it, that's basically what it was oman today is a very 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 modern country um very peaceful it's kind of like the 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 peaceful overseer of everything happening in the arab world it's just where things are, you know, not so drama, I suppose, <laughs> compared to other countries in the Arab world. But um, Sultan Qaboos in his later years was very ill, and he passed away at the beginning of 2020, which, I mean, he ruled for so long, it was um, a very sad time for the people, but, um, and traditionally, the sultans here would pass the title on to their sons, and it had been that way since, like, forever. But Sultan Qaboos didn't have any children, so it went to his cousin, it's Haitem bin Tariq, I believe that's how you say his name, and, um, he assumed the throne in early 2020, so it's a little too soon to say, like, how Oman is doing. There, it's just kind of been continuing on its upward trend, to be honest. So, it's a new chapter in Omani history, just beginning. So it'll be interesting to watch and see just what happens in Oman. It's one of those countries that definitely has the pattern in its history of going down and then going way up and then going down and going way up. So it's on that way up, and hopefully there's no more downs because the country's had too many downs and. It's always good to have ups, right? So anyway, let's flip through the book and look at some cool pictures of Oman. Here's all the white buildings you can see. Super cool. Reminds me of like Santorini. Right? There's something so relaxing about all white buildings. Look at these faces. <laughs> Aren't they sweet? Oh, this three very cute little faces. Here's, oh, I gotta move my water and everything, hold on. There we go, okay. I always forget about that. Crossing the desert. The big empty desert spaces. Will I be able to turn the page? Who knows? Okay. Let's see. It doesn't say where this is, but... I, it's probably Muscat, because you can see the water right there. Man, these pages are very thick. This is also a brand new book, so this is the Rupal Kali. There's nothing here except angry spirits. But then you get this. This is outside of Salala. Up in the mountains. Isn't that beautiful? It's like a little paradise. Here's the frankincense trees. And there's some sweet camels having a bite. Let's see what else we have. Some more beautiful white buildings there. And just a big old <laughs> Oman map here. Not a lot of pictures in this history chapter. Look how funny this is. Like, no pictures. Here's a Tao. Kind of the more modern version. Not so much like the ancient version. They took some ideas from European ships and incorporated them into theirs. Look at this. <laughs> Christopher Columbus has nothing to do with Oman. <laughs> so the caption's like... Columbus was likely trying to reach areas like Oman when he was in the West. Okay. And that's it for the history chapter. Here is the palace in Muscat. So I said before that the sultans always lived in Salala. Um, so Muscat was like the, the, the workplace and Salala was the living place. But Sultan Qaboos changed that and sultans live in Muscat now. This is... Um, the new sultan, Sultan Haitham. Haitham. Mm -hmm. Positive. Meeting a um, U.S. diplomat. Here's the Supreme Court building. But like I said, you know, the judges can pass 
whatever they like, but if the Sultan says, mm, no, <laughs> then that's the word. <laughs> Here's some Omani Rial, very colorful money. There's some geese on money. Here's an oil drill. Some dates on the date palms. And here is the very ancient irrigation system, the Fallage system. And this guy has caught a fish and is, I guess, pulling the hook out the fish's mouth. <laughs> that big old knife there. And there's, it looks like a refinery or natural gas. I'm not sure. Here's an Arabian oryx, one of the endangered animals to live in Oman. It's amazing. And another endangered animal, the green sea turtle, nests on the beaches and um, gets very carefully watched. Here's a, a beautiful Barbary falcon. Kind of looks like a parrot. Oh, it's similar to the Peregrine Falcon. <laughs> they look very, very similar. Some solar panels being installed in the desert, making use of all that hot nothingness to use some green energy to power the country. And uh, another picture with just a lot of nothing. <laughs> a lot of nothing. Another very sweet face. Cute kids in this book. Waving the flag here. There isn't a box about flags in this book, so I'll show you the one in the back. Here's the market in Salomon. Like big old water bottle in the way. That's why the book's crooked. There we go. With everything for sale. Some different examples of uh, dress. Let's see. This guy is driving his truck through the mountains. This talks about how another... Um, policy that Sultan Qaboos did, because a lot of oil-rich countries like the UAE and Kuwait import a lot of people from poor nations around the world to do the dirty work, but Sultan Qaboos was like, no, that's a waste of money, we're only going to hire Omanis. So I think that's what this picture is kind of showing, that like, Omani people do all the hard work and they don't really focus on having expats and like foreigners come in to do all the work. Bedouin child there with his camels. Let's see. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? Lighthouse of Sur built by the Portuguese. Oh, wow. Another beautiful market. This is in Muscat. And a Bedouin tribe. See their little fire pit and Looks like they're going to have a little chill-out session. They've got some hookahs, and blankets, and pillows set out. They're going to have a fun night. Beautiful henna tattoos for a bride, looks like. A very important wedding tradition, and it's so beautiful. And this guy is working in an herb market. He's burning some herbs, or incense, it says here. And it's for health purposes. Another very sweet face here. I was going to say, this must be Dalfitter, because she's all dressed up, and she got a Barbie. So, you know, there's presents and fancy dress. Let's see, there's, there's always a box about, like, what is Islam? And there's always a picture of Mecca, so that's what that is. Here is Miss God's Grand Mosque. Let's take a closer look, because I love religious buildings. It's always so detailed. So the rug there looks like it's a billion years old, right? And then, of course, you have gorgeous chandeliers. <laughs> That's so lovely. How neat. It's like, up here is like Versailles, and down here is like... <laughs> ancient. <laughs> I don't know how to like, like think of like an ancient building, I'm not sure. Looks like they've sold a goat. Or something, or they're just saying hello. Mmm, <laughs> coffee. This talks about the silent language, etiquette, like serving tea and coffee. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's go shopping. What do you want to buy? I want. Hmm. 
Oh, there's some. Hold on. Really cool rings over here. I would definitely be looking through here. All the rings, but my gosh. These up here, um, I forget the name of them, but I'll show you when we get to the flag because they're on the flag. These are very traditional knives that men wear on like their waist just above their hip. They were originally made out of rhino horns. I'm sure they're not anymore, but um, it's a very important part of traditional costume. Look at Gladiator. <laughs> What's that doing there? Anyway, let's get all these trinkets down here too. And get a little camel or something down there. How neat. Let's see, they're sewing. Making some nice fabrics. And let's see. Oh, it's a novelist who won the Booker International Prize. Um, Jolka Altar Alharti. There we go. Basket weaving. Very, very ancient. Probably using, oh yeah, the date palm leaves. Let's see, an old suit here. And go shopping inside. And a fort it says 400 years old, it was just restored. They have so many really cool ancient buildings that have been either preserved or restored. That's just one of them. Playing some bagpipes in the parade. And the buildings might be white, but they can decorate their doors in however they want. So all the doors and all the white buildings are very colorful, which is really cool. A bike race is happening here. And let's see, oh, they're drinking some coffee. He's got a guest, you gotta serve him coffee. And falconry. That seems like such a cool hobby. Like you just get to like hang out with a pet bird. Just watch it fly around. That always seemed like such a cool hobby. Wow. Okay. So he's right in the camel. Standing up. That's pretty cool. A little football field out here in the middle of nowhere. Let's take a closer look. That's so funny. All set up for a match. Oh, and one of the beautiful spots for diving and exploring in the water with this little dow out there too. And driving all over the sand dunes. That always seems so scary to me. I would not enjoy four-wheel driving, to be honest. Fireworks displays. And, oh, they're celebrating National Day, wearing all white, and they've got sparklers. And this is the Salala Festival, doing some traditional dancing. Oops, I don't want to skip any pages. What if there's some cool pictures? Okay, I'm not. They're just really thick pages. Um, morning prayers during Ramadan, it says. Food. Um, date pudding, this is. And we've got shuwa. It says, national dish of Oman served at weddings and holidays. Meat marinated in spices and cooked underground with rice on the side. A bit of yogurt, it looks like. Kebabs, of course, yum yum. And I was about to say sliders. I guess this is how they serve food. They're one of those cultures that just has tiny portions of everything on the plates, which I'm not opposed to. <laughs> so delicious. Let's see, let's see. More food, some traditional bread being baked there, and here's their, uh, I was about to say yogurt, but apparently it's pudding with nuts on top. Another cool little map of Oman. Green, of course, here doesn't mean green, it means elevation. And orange means high elevation. And this is where Oman's located in the world. Let me flip back to this section here with the flag, which I normally don't show you guys these because um, it's not a lot of info and it's just a lot of repeated stuff mostly, but here's the flag with the, um, what's it called, the emblem on it, and you can see the knife here, what's it called, the Kanjar dagger, that's what it's called, with some other sword. So, that's going to be it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Isn't Oman a fascinating country? 
This is one of those countries that I literally knew nothing about it other than where it was and what the capital was. So I learned so many cool stuff. Let me know what you guys have learned about Oman. It, it makes me kind of want to visit this country now. It sounds pretty exciting. Probably um, Salala more than Muscat. It seems a little too hot over there. Anyway, thank you again for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good